I am Mary Sue Keppel, the editor of Calliope, and you are listening to Writer to Writer. With me today is a wonderful guest, Robert Morgan. Welcome. Good to be here. Robert, would you mind telling us just a bit about yourself, your background, and what you do now? Well, I was born in uh, western North Carolina in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Grew up on a little farm there in the late 40s and early 50s. Uh, went off to college in the early 60s to study engineering and mathematics mm -hmm. in those years when we were supposed to beat the Russians <laughs> uh, while I was a student at NC State University studying uh, applied mathematics. I took a course in writing and got very involved in, in writing both uh, fiction and poetry and never looked back in a sense. Mm -hmm. uh, I published three stories as an undergraduate in little magazines, then really discovered poetry in the late 60s and just fell in love with it and wrote it and dreamed about it and read it. Uh, the poetry got published pretty quickly. By the time I was 21 or 22, I was publishing in national magazines. I was hired by Cornell University to teach poetry writing in 1971. Uh, I was told I would have only one year there, and I've been there 30 now. <laughs> <laughs> and to what do you attribute that? Your national mm -hmm. reputation, I would suspect. Mm -hmm. The fact that you are a very good teacher, I would suspect. Well, I, I loved Cornell. I, di I discovered I really kind of had a home there. Uh, I have told people that one reason I like Cornell is that it is in northern Appalachia. I came from southern Appalachia <laughs> to northern Appalachia, and it's also a great uh, ag school and engineering school as well as an arts college. Mm -hmm. I like to say I like to be at a university with the world's greatest weed experts and star experts. <laughs> now this tells us a lot about you. You are also, besides being a poet, very well known as a novelist. In fact, Oprah selected one of your pieces to be a part of her book club, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But you are also known then as the novelist. How did you make that transition, or was there no transition? Well, there was a long period of transition because I didn't write any prose fiction throughout the 1970s. And about 1980, I knew I wanted to go back to writing fiction because I wanted to tell some of the stories I'd heard from my grandpa and from my dad and my mother, all these stories about the Civil War, going back to the Revolutionary War even, about panthers and snakes and ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> and weeds. And I also realized I wanted to do voices. I had never been able to write poetry in voices other than my own. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to get in some of those voices I had heard as a child growing up in the Blue Ridge Mountains. I wrote story after story throughout the early 1980s, continued to publish poetry and to teach poetry. I did not have the courage to show anybody the fiction I was writing because I was known as a poet. But eventually, about 1986, a friend of mine named Lamar Heron who edited uh, Epic Magazine then, mm -hmm. said, I hear you're writing short stories. Why don't you show us a short story? So I did. And he said, oh, we like this. We're going to publish it. And that gave me so much confidence. I started sending out stories. Mm -hmm. And some got taken by magazines. I put together a little book of short stories called The Blue Valleys, sent it off to Peachtree Publishers in Atlanta. I'd heard they published Southern Fiction. And they accepted it. And when was that? Published it in the spring of 1989. Uh -huh. In two weeks, it got more reviews and sold more copies than all my books of poetry put together. And it got a rave in the New York Times, which had never paid any attention to the poetry. Another great breakthrough for me in 1989 was that I was uh, doing research for a novel based on the life and death of my Uncle Robert, in the Air Force in World War II. He was killed in a B-17 crash. I had gone to England and found the site of the crash. I interviewed pilots, navigators, bombardiers. I studied the history of, of World War II. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get started on the book. I was so bogged down in technical details. This one, is the engineer in you coming through. And one day I thought, well, why don't I let the fiance of the soldier tell part of the story? And I started uh, 
dreaming my way into the mind of this character. She's now in her 70s. It's in the 1980s. She's in a nursing home. She's lost a limb. She's being outfitted with an artificial foot. And she's remembering 1940, 1941, 1942, seeing her fiance off and getting the telegram that he's been killed. And I could hear her voice. And uh, by the time I had 30 pages, I knew this was the best thing I'd ever written. It was so scary to be writing in the voice of a woman character. Let's what talk did about I know? that. You know, uh, it was so scary that I just gave it everything I had. I erased myself and tried to imagine how she would see things. How would she say it? Mm -hmm. how, how would she think about 1940, 1941, mm -hmm. 1942? And I discovered that that's really what fiction writing is about. It's about getting into the mind of your characters. It's not about self-expression, but getting, it's like, be, like acting. Mm -hmm. Is this fiance in the, in the books like someone that you knew? I mean, did you pattern her on somebody from your background? Did that uh, help you? Very loosely. My uncle did have a fiance, but I made up this character almost mm -hmm. completely. Is she a composite of people that you knew? Probably, but the fun of it was to imagine this woman who is this age and has had certain experiences and to try to get her voice. Give us some tips for the people who are listening who are writers. How do you put yourself into another sex and then achieve a voice? Well, I think it's very much like uh, taking on a role in acting. I mean, mm -hmm. actors, of course, read their part. Yeah. They think about the motivation of the character. They think about you know, what they're going to wear, how they're going to look, how they're going to move their body. And I make notes the way an actor does about the character. You know, what, what would she wear? How would she say something? If you can get a phrase or two. And then the breakthrough for me is getting the voice, mm -hmm. the level of education, mm -hmm. the attitude. Once I have the voice, I can usually go with the story. My fiction is voice driven. Mm -hmm. And in the case of that novel, which became The Mountains Won't Remember Us, and another novella called The Trace, the first part of The Hinterlands, and then my next big breakthrough, the novel called The Truest Pleasure, based on the marriage of my paternal grandparents, whom I never knew. I had written that in third person as a novella, mm -hmm. and I thought it worked pretty well, but I knew it wasn't quite right. One day I thought, why don't I let the woman, Jenny, tell the story of the marriage? Because I discovered that you have certain advantages telling a story, particularly a story of marriage, from the point of view of the woman. Oh, now tell us what that means. Women are closer observers of detail, the kind of living detail that will make a story come alive. I know my wife notices the wallpaper or what somebody's wearing, usually better than I do. Uh -huh. uh, but especially if you're writing about a relationship or a marriage, uh -huh. women are usually more willing to talk about their emotions, their relationships and marriage than men. Would you say that your novels then are dependent less on plot than they are on the characters and that because that's true, you need the woman's voice to notice the detail and keep the emotional power going? Oh yes, for me the stories are usually voice driven. Once I have the yeah. character talking, the plot comes out of the character and the character comes out of the voice. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, once I started rewriting that novella, it just exploded into a 550-page novel, mm -hmm. which became the truest pleasure. Are you, are you one of those guys who plots exactly what's going to happen, so when you start your novel, you know how it's going to end, you know what each character is going to do in major scenes, or is the writing a surprise for you? Mostly it's a surprise for me. I have a vague idea where the story's going. Uh -huh. In Gap Creek, I knew they were going to get married and move down to Gap Creek, and they would have a hard year. <laughs> But for me, uh, uh, part of the pleasure is the surprise of the character telling the story, of letting her tell the story. And, and uh, in fact, when I was writing those two novels, I couldn't wait hardly to get up in the morning to see what she would tell me, what the character ah. would tell me. Mm -hmm. uh, if it doesn't surprise me, will it surprise the reader? Mm 
-hmm. One of the best bits of advice I was ever given about novel writing was from my colleague and friend, Alison Lurie. When I told her I was working on a novel, I said, do you have any advice? She said, well, for somebody who's written poetry and critical essays, uh, you're used to being in control of your writing and being in intellectual control. But for novel writing, you need to find a passive gear mm. where you follow your characters and you let the story evolve through them. I found that to be very good advice. Uh, mm -hmm. That the, the dynamics of the story come out of the characters and they often surprise you. You don't know what they're going to do <laughs> until you get there. <laughs> and that's part of the fun of the writing, and it's part of the fun of reading good fiction, too, if you don't know what's going to happen. Well, I'm interested as a, as a uh, poet. Don't you um, have that same experience when you write a really good poem, that the first couple of times through, you're not really sure where that poem is going to take you? Or do you know, when you start the poem, where that poem is going? No, I think you're right. It is similar. It's just on a, a smaller scale in mm. terms of time. That is, uh, the, the intense excitement of writing a poem is partly just to discover where this voice is going to take you, where this mm -hmm. form is going to take mm -hmm. you, where these images and metaphors, and uh, it is similar. Uh, but a poem is usually over, <laughs> you know, in, in, in two or three or four drafts in, in a, a few days or weeks, mm -hmm. though I have worked on poems for as long as 15 years. Ah. coming back to them again and again. And how many drafts would you do of a poem that took you 15 years? Uh, I worked on the poem called Lightning Bugs from 1968 to 1983. Ah. And I probably rewrote it 20 times, hmm. going back to the notebooks and finding the poem and making it longer, taking something out, adding something. Finally, in 1983, I got the last line, the last image. Well, I'm impressed at 20. I was expecting 200, so mm -hmm. you got it at 20. Wonderful. Could we just jump into um, what you were talking about before you brought up Gap Creek? And mm -hmm. this is the novel that was chosen for the uh, Oprah's Book Club. Mm -hmm. I understand you've been interviewed, actually, by Oprah. What's the story there? Tell mm -hmm. us about that. Well, I had no warning at all that I was being considered for the Oprah Book Club. Uh, one snowy evening in upstate New York, January of uh, 2000, the phone rang, and a woman with a vaguely southern accent, without introducing herself, said, it's true what they say on the back of your book, it's the work of a master. Uh -huh. And I said, well, thank you. <laughs> She said, no, I mean it. It's so intense, it's so vivid, it's so detailed, I could not put the book down. And I said, well, thank you. She said, uh, could I ask you a question? What does my senior really die of in the first uh. chapter? <laughs> and I had to say to this unknown person, he chokes to death on worms in this horrible scene. The only uh, true scene in the book, that my grandmother did have a younger brother, my senior, who died that way. Truly. And then this woman said, uh, still without introducing herself, I have a book club I would like for you to visit. And I had decided by then this must be somebody I had met on book tour down in Spartanburg or Greenville, South Carolina. I'm 800 miles away, and I'll just be polite. So I said, well, I'd be happy to when I'm in the area. And she said, well, where are you? And I said, upstate New York. She said, Oh, you're up north. I'm up north, too. I'm in Chicago. <laughs> and then I recognized Oprah Winfrey's voice. <laughs> so she did the phone call herself, so and she Oprah, called uh, you herself. Uh, so that first, I, I had the impression as I read this first chapter that it stood by itself and probably was published as a short story. Am I all wrong? No, it, it, um, it was never published separately. Um, but it was the breakthrough. Oh. I had... Uh, tried to start this novel several times in uh, 1996 and early 1997, had worked so intensely on the novel before it, the one narrated by Jenny Powell, mm -hmm. who's kind of bookish. She's a mountain farm wife, but she reads a lot and loves words and is very confident of her voice. I could not get out of her voice every time I started what became Gap Creek. Mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. was Jenny's voice that came out. I gave it up in frustration. Mm 
and wrote only poetry and some short stories in 1997. I moved down to Davidson College near Charlotte to be visiting writer in residence in the spring of 1998. And I think it was being back in the South, hearing the idiom of the Piedmont and the mountains mm -hmm. every day that inspired me. But one day I thought, well, I can use Julie's lack of education and her lack of confidence as part of the voice, as uh -huh. part of the character. Uh -huh. And I started writing about uh, the death of my senior. I know about the death of my senior because I was there. I've seen it. Uh, you saw that. I don't know if we should tell our audience what actually goes on in that chapter because it is a very, very... It's a gruesome it, scene. That's a good word. I, I remember a book I read that had that same kind of scene, but it happened in the Orient. I don't remember the title of the book. I do not remember the author of the book. I remember that scene, and I think I will carry it to my grave as I will carry this one. Um, I've been I think told that's, by doctors that, that this is true. It really does happen. Well, and you saw it yourself. So, with that, no, I, I didn't oh. see it. I was told the story, but I, oh. I was I was quoting Julie, who begins yes. the novel. Yes, yes, uh, yes. I thought you had said that that you had seen it in your family. Uh, it actually happened to my grandmother's younger brother. Oh. It was a story I was told. It's one of those stories I wanted to write that you I wanted to write, to which came through this. Let's talk for a minute, um, changing the subject, not at all, but it seems as if we are. Gap creep. Gap Creek works because of the dialect in it. But the dialect is not intrusive. Could you talk to us for a bit about people who want to put dialect into their stories or their short stories, even their poetry? How do they do that without being intrusive? I can describe how I did it. Uh, I knew I wanted to get the voice mm -hmm. right. I wanted it to sound the way somebody with this much education from this particular place at this time, the way they would say something. Mm -hmm. But I also knew that if you have too much dialect and phonetic spelling, that it will turn the reader away. Right. It will distance the reader from the character. For me, the whole point is to make the reader intimate with the voice and with the point of view mm -hmm. of the narrator. Mm -hmm. So it is a kind of artistic trick. You get some dialect, some double negatives. She says herself instead of himself. She throws in from time to time expressions, idiomatic expressions of the region. Mm -hmm. But in fact, I worked hard to keep it clear to all literate readers. So it's really pronouns, idioms, and I noticed a lot of subject-verb agreement or mm -hmm. tense problems. Right. Uh, uh, was instead of were yeah. often. And it's mostly just done you know, to my ear. There's, uh -huh. there's not a formula to it. I try uh -huh. to make it sound the way she would talk if she's talking about that subject. Yeah. Uh, for instance, chapters often begin with very simple language. And as they get more intense, the language gets more complex. The yes. reader is not supposed to notice that. Yes, yes. But that's wonderful. <laughs> Could you read us a little, a little um, um, part of it? I, I know you had prepared maybe a little section to read for us. Well, the, the scene I have been asked about most often is the birth scene. Uh, people say, how did you, a man, know how to write about this birth scene from the point of view of the woman? And I usually say, well, I did attend Lama's classes with my wife on two different, <laughs> for two different periods, and um, I was present at the birth of, uh, of my two daughters, uh, but mostly I just made it up. I tried to put myself in the situation and imagine how she would say it. She's a 17-year-old woman. She's alone in a farmhouse 100 years ago. There's no telephone. There's no close neighbor. The 1899. Start. Well, this would be the spring of 1900. They got married in 1899. And uh, she's terrified. She says, I was so weak I couldn't do a thing but lay there. The ceiling of the kitchen wobbled and stretched and spun around above me. I held onto a table leg to make things get still. What hope is there, I thought. What hope is there for the baby? And I've seen how I had to do everything for the baby. It didn't matter about me. 
If I was finished, I was finished. But the baby had to be saved. The baby had to be protected. But I was near helpless on my own. The only sweetness in the world I could think of was that Jesus might be looking down on me with love and concern. There was nobody else to see me in my misery. There was nobody else to help me through. Please, Jesus, I said, show me some mercy. Not for my sake, but for the little baby. I was sick and weak and scared and I was flat on my back. The pain between my legs come worser than before. But it felt like somebody took my hand. It felt like there was a firmness in the air around me. That was lovely. I, I remember reading that scene and being very impressed with the way in which you use colors. Mm -hmm. That um, at certain times in her life, her emotions are expressed by kind of a mm -hmm. color that she sees or experiences. And I was waiting for you to get to that part. Mm -hmm. But thank you. That was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Now, would you do us a favor and read a poem mm -hmm. so that we as listeners can see the, the difference between the dialogue, the dialect, really, the sounds, the voices? Well, this is a poem called Working in the Rain. And it's one of a series I have written about my dad, who was a farmer and carpenter and part-time mason in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And I think more than any single person, he has influenced my writing. Mm -hmm. He was not uh, very well educated in a formal sense, mm -hmm. but he was a great talker and a reader of the Bible. And uh, he, uh, he loved local history and that sort of thing. But he could not work with other people. He could not work off on public jobs, he would have called it. Uh, what he loved to do was work by himself mowing grass or working in the field and uh, more than anybody I've ever known he liked to actually get out and work when it was raining. <laughs> so after his death I wrote this poem uh, about that. My father loved more than anything to work outside in wet weather. Beginning at daylight he'd go out and dripping brush to mow or pull weed. First, his shoulders got damp, and the drops from his hat ran down his back. When even his armpits were soaked, he came in to dry out by the fire, make coffee, read a little. But if the rain continued, he'd soon be restless and go out to sharpen tools in the shed or carry wood in from the pile, then open up a puddle to the drain, working by steps back into the downpour. I think he sought the privacy of rain. The one time no one was likely to be out and he was left to the intimacy of drops touching every leaf and tree in the woods and the easy muttering of drip and runoff, the shine of pools behind grass dams. He could not resist the long ritual the companionship and freedom of falling weather, or even the cold drenching, the heavy soak and chill of clothes and sobbing of fingers and sacrifice of shoes that earned a baking by the fires and washed fatigue after the wandering and loneliness in the country of rain. I love the line, the intimacy of mm -hmm. rain. I had never thought about that till I read your poem. And so beautifully puts that experience of what rain might do for the human being. You said that Garrison Keillor read this on... Uh, I think it's called Writer's Almanac. Writer's and Almanac, He yes. read that one and another poem called uh, The Grain of Sound. So mm. some very famous people mm. have recognized your, your work, famous in the sense that people today would recognize their names. Has Oprah changed your life? Uh, she has. She has made it a lot busier. <laughs> Uh, the greatest thing she has done is given me so many more readers. Uh, Gap Creek has now sold about a million and a half copies in this country. And My goodness. It's been a bestseller in Australia and Germany, My goodness. Canada. Uh, and I'm going on halftime teaching uh, beginning next year. Uh, but I've just been so much busier in the past year. Uh, it's been wonderful. Uh, 
I have uh, reached the age, I think, where I actually enjoy getting out of my study and meeting readers mm -hmm. and talking to people about writing. In a way, I did not when I was younger. Mm -hmm. Because? Oh, I think it has to do with being in my 50s as opposed to in my 30s and <laughs> having spent all those years sitting alone reading and writing. And uh, it also has to do with the reception of your work. If you have millions of people reading your work and, uh, and enthusiastic readers, it's fun to get out and meet them. So you no longer have to be afraid of what the reaction is going to be. You are just there to enjoy it. I have enjoyed it, uh, yes. Uh, people have been very generous about Gap Creek. Uh, well, your next project? We have about 30 seconds. I have a new book called This Rock, which is a sequel to The Truest Pleasure, coming out in September uh -huh. of this year. Uh, Hank from Gap Creek is a prominent uh, character in it. <laughs> uh, it's it's uh, the same locale about a young man who dreams of building this huge church on top of a mountain. Ah, what a dream. Can you, in this last 10 seconds, give us something to take home that will help us as writers? Piece of advice, mm -hmm. as you got that wonderful piece of advice from your friend. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say that we only learn about writing from the act of writing. Mm -hmm. And there's no secret to writing except the doing of it. And it's mm -hmm. the writing that will teach you how you write because everybody does it in a different way. Wonderful mm -hmm. advice. Thank you for joining us today. My guest has been Robert Morgan, wonderful author of Gap Creek, which has made him famous in Oprah's eyes and in the eyes of many people around the world. This has been Writer to Writer, and I've been Mary Sue Keppel. Thank you. Thank you.